All right, so welcome everyone if you're watching this on Twitch or later on YouTube. Thank you for joining this lecture. Today um, we will be talking about sequence analysis. Um, I hope everything goes well. Had a little bit of technical issues, but that should all be solved by now. Um, so let's just start with the first slide. So unfortunately for you guys, or fortunately for you guys, I actually managed to secure a date for the exam. So the exam will be on the 17th of February at 2 p.m. So write it down in your agenda. Um, I don't know exactly how we will do the exam, if it will be in person. So if you have to show up here, if it will be online or what kind of format, but I am going to be very, very generous. Um, so if people show up to the exam, then I won't make it too hard. Uh, so 17th of February, um, 2 p.m. Note it down in your agenda. I will also send around an email, of course, to remind everyone. Um, so the people that are not watching the stream or watching it later on YouTube. Oh my God, you got a date. Yes, yes. I actually managed to call the Prüfungsbüro. And you know what, what they actually told me? Like, oh, yeah, no, no. You, you sent that email like four weeks ago, but I haven't been in the office for seven weeks. Yeah, so... Shocko, yeah. <laughs> but we got a date, so at least we got a date. Now now we still have to figure out how we're going to do it. But I think we'll manage, like, um, I'm, I'm generally really, really, like, relaxed about exams. Um, and I hope that I will be able, actually, to do a drawing exercise for you guys. Because, like, I do drawings for you guys when you save up enough fewer points, right? So on the exam, you guys are probably going to have a drawing for me for extra credits. Um, that's kind of what we always do. Um, so be prepared. Have your, like, pen and paper and coloring pencils ready. A puffer fish. Um, is there also a second appointment? Yes, I submitted a second date, but since I was on the phone with the Prüfungsbüro and I didn't want to make it even harder for them, um, the second date is going to be in April somewhere. Um, so yeah, I would like everyone to do the first exam because that that's the easiest for all of us, right? Then we can just do one exam, I can grade it, everyone gets their passing grade and then we're done. Um, but yeah, there is also a second appointment and I will let you know in the email. Although the second appointment is not finalized yet, so it might still change. Um, but I will make that clear in the email. Good, so good luck for you guys on the exam. I will probably mention the same thing next week again, just to make sure that everyone has it fresh in his mind that they should start studying for the exam. Good. So the overview for today is going to be sequence analysis, right? So um, I added the last part. So the last part is completely new, never have done it before. I put it in the back so that everyone stays and uh, watches the last part of the lecture as well. Um, and I'm hoping that that will be fun. Um, but we'll start off with uh, genome annotation. So how do you annotate a genome or a new genome that you make? Um, uh, Genie 88. Yes, a second exam date would be great. Some exams are overlapping. Yeah, yeah. So th there's always going to be a second date. And if we do a, an oral exam, then of course we will do the oral exam um, somewhere, right? We can more or less freely plan it then. Why don't you have a little diamond, Genie 88, by the way? Um, let me fix that for you. So let's see, community. Uh, where do I do that? It's a long time ago that I actually set a new VIP for my channel. Um, so, add a new Genie88. There you are. Um, and I want you to be a uh, VIP. Good. All right. So, next time you say something, Genie, um, you will have a little diamond in front of your name as well. Like, I, I try to use the VIP status for, for students, so I know who is a student who will, and who isn't. Um, although Misha has one as well, but he's here every week, so that's why he deserves one. 
Um, good, so genome annotation, right? So how do you annotate a novel genome? Imagine that you are uh, pff, sequencing a puffer fish, right? And there's no puffer fish genome available, and then you get the DNA sequence. Um, and how do we now figure out where genes start, where they end, and these kinds of things. Um, then I wanted to talk a lot about sequence alignments because alignment is kind of the core of bioinformatics, right? So bioinformatics started as a field in like the 1960s, 1970s, um, when we started doing like DNA sequencing and protein sequencing. Um, so how to align protein sequences against each other and how to align DNA sequences against each other is kind of a fundamental part of bioinformatics because that's where the field of bioinformatics started. Um, so we will talk about pairwise alignment, what's the difference between global and local alignment. We'll talk about multiple sequence alignment, so what happens when you have more than one sequence or more than two, right? So imagine that you're interested in the evolution of a certain gene. Um, then of course multiple sequence alignment will help you to kind of figure out how these sequences are related. Um, I wanted to say a few words about structural alignment, so alignment not based on the sequence but based on the 3D structure of, um, of molecules like DNA and proteins. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about DNA motifs uh, and genome assembly using whole genome sequencing since those things fit in quite nicely with multiple sequence alignment. And then of course I'm going to teach you guys how to do this in R so that you don't have to go to a website and click and point. No, um, you can actually just write a script in R um, which does multiple sequence alignment for you and combine this with Biomart, right? So the automatic downloading of sequences from Ensemble or other databases, um, you can actually build quite nifty tools which actually do quite interesting things. And I will show you an example of my own work. But of course, as always, we will first do the answers to the previous assignments. Um, and I actually thought about it because for the YouTube recording, it might actually be smarter to do the solutions um, at the end. But I think that for you guys, it's good that you can just watch like the first part and see, okay, so I wanted to just get the answers to the assignments. Um, but let me actually open up my notepad window so that you guys can see. Um, so here it still says lecture nine, but because we had the R introduction lecture, it actually moved one up. Um, so these are my answers, so let's go through them one by one. Um, so I hope that everyone was able to do them, at least the uh, like PubMed stuff should be relatively easy. So question one was, using PubMed, find all my publications um, and remember that I've only been publishing since 2010. Um, right, so the standard way that you would do this, you would just say PubMed, right, and then you would say, okay, so I'm interested in this guy, this guy is called Danny Aaron, so let's look at his publications, right, and you just search for my name on PubMed. Um, let me make this a little bit smaller and get rid of the cookie pop-up. Um, so you see that it gives you some results, right, and um, it actually looks pretty good. So you see that my publications are there um, and it seems that nowadays it actually figured out that I am a, a new person publishing instead of the old one. Um, I used to have a lot of um, publications from some guy named De Arens as well um, who was actually publishing in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so of course those are not my publications but since the name is very similar um, then you can find like his publications as well. Um, so if you probably would search for De Arens, then probably would find the older ones as well, right? So here you see the publications written by this other person. And then in 2010, it starts by me publishing. So only the ones from 2010. Good, so the question was find all my publications. And then the answer was, um, oh, so there's not really an answer. So the Question number B is why are there so many false positives? Well, there are so many false positives, of course, because De Arens as a name or um, is not unique, right? And if you would search for Denny Arens, then you probably wouldn't find all of my publications. Um, so there's also false negatives, right? Because not every publication that gets published actually has the full first name of the author. Right, so you can see that in total, um, in PubMed, there are 160 results, so 160 publications. Um, when I then search for my own name, um, so my full name, um, then I get 40 results. 
Um, but if I look at my Google Scholar, right, so to figure out how many I really have, because on Google Scholar I'm pretty like good at like keeping the track record that I do, um, then here it will tell me that there are more than 40 publications in total. Um, so you, you don't find all of them easily. Um, there are some filters that you can add, right? So if we go here, then we could say a uh, day Arons, right? That's what we want to search for. So we just do it like this. Um, and then we want to uh, do something like publication date. Um, so from 2010, so 2010. Um, and then I have to use the user guide to get the exact way of writing it. Um, key concept, searching by journal, searching by date. Um, so use the results timeline. That's one of the ways, right? You could just drag the slider um, and you can also use the search builder. Um, so you can say um, publication date like this, right? So I can just add 2022. Um, so this then would be uh, 2010 slash 0101. And then I would have to add and say that this is a DP date of publishing search. And then there are no results. Is that because of the fact that it doesn't match the name properly? Interesting. So now it, it actually, so doing this, I find a lot and then saying from publication date, oh, you have to specify the Boolean operator. All right, so, okay, let's see if that works your search was processed with automatic term mapping because it retrieves zero results. Interesting, interesting, interesting. All right, PubMed is a bitch sometimes. It's sometimes really hard finding stuff that you want to find. But then you can use the automatic term builder or you can just say, well, just search for my name, right? And then just use the slider like they are recommending. So I could just say, go from 2010 um, and then it will update. And now you see that it finds 104. Um, of course, I want to search for day Arons. So it's interesting that it finds vitamin D in oncology, while the term Arons is probably not there at all. This is also not one of my publications. Interesting. So it's, it's relatively difficult getting a good overview in PubMed, but you can use the query builder and you can use the help. Um, so for you guys, just go through it and, and figure out how to do it. Um, I also put a link there, so use a more complex query um, using search field tags. So that's what I try to do by adding the publication date, but then it doesn't show anything. Good. So let's go to the second question, right? It's not that important that you guys know how many publications I have. That's of no interest to anyone except for myself. All right, so when um, we, uh, uh, the next question is uh, Uniprat. So let's first go to Uniprat. And there we go. So let's go to Uniprot. And now the question was, find the names of supported query fields from the Uniprot help. And fortunately, I actually had the help link open. So here are all of the query fields that you can use um, in Uniprot, right? So, and query fields are stuff that, that allow you to, to kind of um, tell the search engine what you mean. So these are things that Google doesn't do, right? So in, in Google, you can search and Google is pretty good at searching, um, but they're very bad at filtering stuff. Um, so if you wanna say, I want to have uh, web pages where the subject of the web page contains a certain word, then you can't do that. Um, but with Uniprot, you can, for example, do things like counting, right? So you can say, um, list all entries with exactly five transmembrane regions. So, hey, you can, you can build queries and the, the search engine will understand that you are searching for things like, hey, so transmembrane count is five. So it will understand that and then will give you back search results, which are much more logical. All right, so how many reviewed protein entries exist presently in Uniprot KB for chicken? All right, so let's go back to Uniprot. Um, so we are interested in chicken. Um, so we have to do this. Good. So huh, because I want to have um, reviewed, so reviewed protein entries. So I have to say reviewed is yes. And then I say, and organism is 
uh, gullus gullus, which is chicken, which is 9031. Um, so the, the query that I actually typed in right is like this. So I specify the organism and then I specify that I only want to have reviewed protein entries. Um, so if we do this search, um, then in total it will tell us that there are 2,297 verified entries for proteins in chickens. How many of them have been created since uh, 0109 2011? So again, we update our query. Um, so now we add a created date to the query. Um, so we change our query. So we say reviewed is yes, organism is chicken, so 9031, and create it, and then 2011-0901 to star because we want to have the we want to have it up to today. Um, so if we do this query. Um, then we see that since 2011, only 87 verified protein entries have been added for chicken. Right, so the, the results only shows us 87, which is not that much. Um, but of course, there are not that many people working on chicken. All right, um, retrieve the reviewed entry of cattle myostatin. What is the alternative name and what is the accession number? Um, so of course we want to again say, um, because the organism number for cattle um, is 9913. So we want to say, give me myostatin, make sure that it is reviewed and that the organism is cattle. Um, and of course you can get the organism um, identifiers from the, the help, of course. Um, so you can see here that when you search for myostatin that the alternative name is growth slash differentiation factor eight. Um, which is also the old G name because MSTN is the current G name and the previous G name is GDF8. So if you're looking for myostatin in literature, right, and you're looking for literature from the 1960s, 70s and 80s, um, then people would use this gene name. So they would talk about GDF8 in cattle. But what they are actually talking about is, is myostatin in cattle. So hey, you have to keep in the back of your mind um, that a lot of these um, that a lot of genes actually have two th or three names. So by just searching for myostatin, you will only find a subset of the available literature or a subset of the available um, proteins that are out there. Um, so, and that, that is a big issue in, in bioinformatics. And of course, because a computer can't understand that MSTN and GDF8 are the same thing, but, but you as a person can. Um, so what are the gene names of these proteins? So MSDN, GDF8, but it's also called MH. Um, why it's called MH as well, I don't know, but some people probably use that in the past. Um, and of course the current name is MSDN and the GDF8 and MH are called synonyms. So they are, they are the same thing. All right, to which ensemble identifier can bovine myostatin be mapped? All right, so now we have to go inside of the entry, right? And now we want to know the uh, ensemble ID, um, which should be um, here, right? So here we see that in the organism specific databases, we see a ENS, um, so ensemble, BTA, G, and then a whole bunch of zeros, and then it's 11,808. So myostatin is the 11,808 gene in cattle. At least that is, uh, that's how it's annotated. Um, and then, because this is the gene identifier um, it, in host DB, but it's the same for ensemble. Um, and of course a gene, or this thing, also has a protein identifier. Um, so here again you have the gene ID, but there should also be here. Yeah, so here you see the ENS. BTA, so ensemble, bos taurus, and then you see P for protein, right? So that's how the ensemble identifiers are built up. So you have first three letters saying it's ensemble, then three letters specifying which species it is, and then you have a P for protein, or a G for gene, or a T for transcript. Um, so in this case, um, these, this, this one here and this one here. Um, so in the answers I wrote down 1100 and um, 11,808 and the protein number is 16, 160,657. Um, but that's just how it works. Good. Display the entry in raw format. All right, let's go to raw format. Uh, see where the raw format is. Format. Um, 
I want to have a raw format, which is text, right? And then we see this. So when you are searching through this database and you're using a computer, so imagine that I'm using screen scraping, um, yeah, so I'd use R to connect to the database and then once to get this entry, um, yeah, then you see here um, the entry that the computer. So the way that they structure these entries is, is that, for example, you have an ID identifier and then you have a tab or a couple of spaces and then you see here the, 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 the information about, yeah, so this is the identifier. Um, so here we have CAC, which are the accession numbers. So these are the accession numbers at which you can find it in the protein database. Um, then we have, um, yeah, so all of these little things in front, so these two letter codes in front, they, they, they tell you what is go going to come next. So what is going to come next? For example, the ID is the identifier is going to come next. If you see the um, RP, um, then it tells you something else, right? And if you see, for example, um, here, RA, which are probably the authors, um, then hey, you, you see the names of the author. So hey, by using this, you can actually use the computer, load in this text file, and then say, well, I only want to see certain part of this text file because I'm only interested in certain parts um, for my analysis. And of course, they also have things like um, sequences. So SQ means sequence. And then you see here that you have the sequence in almost a FASTA-like format, but not exactly, right? Because it's not, a, it's, it's not having this larger than symbol. All right, so the question was, what does the, li uh, what does the line IDs DT, OS, DR, and FD mean? Um, did I actually write that down? No, I didn't write it down. So let's see if we can figure out what it means. So let's go to uh, DT. So DT is the date at which it was submitted to the database. Right, and then if there are any uh, updates, then it gets, um, yeah, so the, the, the DT is the date date time, date time for uh, the entry. So there's three different ones because they had, this is the original submission in 1998, and then there are some updated submissions um, in, in the past, or in, in the afterwards. OS, so let's search for OS. Um, let me see where the OS identifier is. We don't have an OS identifier. Oh, here, so OS is of course the species at which this protein was determined or yeah, so it OS tells you the species um, that the protein was identified for. Um, then we have DR. So DR is interesting because you see that after DR there's a whole bunch of different things, right? So you see EMBL, then a code, and then another code, and then it says mRNA, right? So DR are actually links from this gene to other databases, right? Because you can see that here after DR, it says, for example, PaxDB. So this entry is called 018836 in PaxDB. If you go to gene tree, then actually it's gene tree is actually using the ensemble identifier. So these are all identifiers for the same protein or for the same gene, but in different databases. Right, and you can also see that there are uh, DRGO, right? So these are gene ontology terms which have been assigned to this protein, right? So it's a muscle cellular homeostasis protein, right? So it's something that works in the muscles. And then the last one was FT. So FT is actually here, and here FT actually tells you the structure of the protein. Right, so you can see that if you look at myostatin, then the first 18 amino acids are uh, the signal part of the peptide, of the, of the protein. Right, and then we see that there's a propeptide, which is 19 to 266. Um, then we see a chain, which is called the growth slash differentiation factor 8. So the, the old name of the whole protein got assigned now to a part of the protein. Um, then you see that there's a site, so there's a cleavage site at which the protein can be cleaved into two parts um, at amino acid 88 to 99. So that's where it cuts between these two amino acids. And you see all kinds of other, um, like, structural components from this protein, right? You see that there's disulfide bonds, um, there's like a carbohydrate thingy, so there's an N-linked asparaginine, so there's a, an amino acid which has been 
chemically modified um, and there's some other things like variants that are there so if we look at Piedmont um, so not the standard cow um, yeah, so in other races you actually have uh, amino acid changes which also get recorded into the database so the FT um, the FT ID um, just refers to this is description of how the protein is structured all right, so then the next question was blastomyostatin protein sequence against Uniprot vertebrates database, default parameters, um, which species show a significant identity? Um, so we can go back, um, we can say blast, and then we just say default because that's what the thing asked us. And then we go, and this might take a little while because we're in the queue, so um, it could take up to a half an hour before we get our results. Good, so first things first, or let's just wait for this one, but um, let's move on to the third question. So the third question was doing stuff with, um, with Bioconductor uh, and using um, and installing Biomart. Yeah, so one of these drawbacks is, is that R, the, um, how, do I, how do you call this? So the R, the R programming language has its own package manager. Which is, called, uh, which is called CRAN, right? So on CRAN are all the official packages. But for bioinformatics, we have another repository holding like 12,000 packages very specifically aimed at bioinformatics. Um, and that is called Bioconductor. So Bioconductor contains um, packages which allow you to do um, annotation of microarrays or analyze cell files and these kinds of things. Right, so because all of these things are relatively frequently updated, for the authors of these packages, it is not worth to submit to CRAN. Because when you submit to CRAN, you're kind of inside of this harness and then your package is not allowed to change that much and because you can't submit updates every week um, because CRAN just says, no, we're here for stable packages that don't really change that much between like January and February or January and December, right? So they, they, they only allow you, I think, to update your package every three months or something. But of course, for bioinformatics, since a lot of packages are relatively new um, and new algorithms get added on a weekly basis sometimes, people don't submit their package to CRAN, the standard repository, um, but they submit it to Biomart. So to install, uh, to, so to install um, Biomart, so they submit their packages to Bioconductor and not to, to Biomart. But first we have to install the Biomart package, right? Because if we want to connect R to Ensemble and other biological databases, we have to have this package installed. Um, so let me go to R. Um, so first things first, I can see if I already have it installed using the install packages command. So if I do install packages, um, then it will give me a long list of everything which is already installed in R. Right, so, and of course I don't want to see all of them, so I, I just want to see the names of the packages. Um, names, sorry, it's a big matrix, so you want to look at the row names. So you can see that in total I have 346 packages installed, and um, I want to know, for example, if Bioconductor is one of them, uh, not Bioconductor, if Biomart is one of them, so say grep, um, I say Biomart, um, in the row names, right? And then it will tell me, yes, it is installed and it is installed like entry number 22. Um, so if I would just say installed.packages, right? Which gives me back a matrix and I say, look at row number 22. Um, then it gives you back something like this. Um, so it tells me that Biomart is already installed. This is where it is installed. Um, and then it gives you like what what other packages does it require, what is the, the, the license, and um, have all, all kinds of other stuff. So I don't have to install it anymore, but let's just install it uh, to make sure that you guys know how to do that. So the first thing that you have to do is um, source the Bioconductor library. And let me actually show you guys by going to Bioconductor. Bioconductor having a hard time typing. So this is Bioconductor, right? So Bioconductor is a, is a, 
is a repository for the R language focused on bioinformatics. Um, so here, if we would search for Biomart, right, then it would find the Biomart package probably. Um, so here we see Bioconductor Biomart, and we just click on the first search result. Um, it's currently not building properly, um, but you can see that it's like the 18th package out of 2000 um, that's on, on Bioconductor. And it's been there for 16 and a half years already. And if you scroll down and you see um, here the installation guide, right? So if yeah, so, if you want to install it, um, what you do is you just copy paste this from here into your R window. So let's just do that. Um, so let's go to the R window and just copy paste it in. And then it will say this is Bioconductor and then it wants to update like a whole bunch of my packages. Um, I don't want to update now, I just want to install it. Um, okay, so I'm not allowed to do that. Package is not installed when version same as current. So I already have Biomart installed, so it tells me that I can reinstall it twice, right? Because I already have the latest version. Um, so I hope everyone was able to install Biomart into their R session, right? But once we have it installed, we can make it active by typing library and then just type library biomart with a capital R and then it will load the package and it will tell you in the meantime that there's actually sub packages that it needs so it also loads those um, but after it's loaded then everything goes okay. All right, so the first step is to connect to Ensemble, right? So we saw this um, in the assignment so we can just say mart is, um, let me look that up. Um, so we can say mart is use mart Right, because we want to use a certain Biomart, and in this case, we want to use Ensemble. So let's connect to Ensemble. Let's hope that it works. Like it might be busy or overloaded, um, so it might take a little while as well. And that's always one of these issues, right? Is if you do stuff um, which which requires an internet connection, and and it's academic software in a way. Um, because Biomart is not a company that gets paid for doing this, um, you sometimes have to wait. And that's just one of these drawbacks when you do bioinformatics is that you are dependent on other people who are either underfunded or they, they do have enough funding, but they, they have 10,000 users. And so it's not as snappy and responsive as Facebook is. But we connect it, um, so that's really nice. Um, so the first thing that I want to kind of figure out is because in the question we want to, um, so the question is, is uh, how many data sets are available in the Ensemble Mart, right? So we can just do list data sets Mart and I will store it in a variable so that I don't have to query it again. And I'm going to just call this uh, DS for data sets, right? So what this will do, it will make a connection to Ensemble, ask Ensemble how many different data sets do you have, and then when I look at the dimensions of DS, it tells me that there are 214 different data sets um, that I can use on, on Ensemble. If I would look at the first five, hey, you see that it's just a, a, a matrix that it returns you, and the first is the data set name, right? So I need to use this name to connect to it. Um, then it gives you a description, and then it tells you the current version of the genome or of the gene that you're connecting to. Because, hey, of course, versions are important, and of course, you always have to write down your version that you're currently using. Um, and hey, if you publish a paper um, using either Biomart or other things, you also want to mention, well, I used um, the genome build Midas 5 um, for my Midas cichlid genes. I have no idea what a, is that like a little bug? Like this, is it like a cicada? I don't know what a cichlid is, but yeah, but if we use the golden eagle, right? So if we, we do some genomic analysis on golden eagles, um, cichlids are fish. Okay, so here again, like my, my perfect knowledge of like biology um, is uh, showing that, see, even Misha knew that they were fish. Now I, now I really look like a jackass for not knowing this. Uh, like, I'm sorry. It's good that Daniel's not here. Daniel would have laughed at me for like not knowing that a cichlid is a, cichlid is a, is a, is a fish. But anyway, and so if you use this, then uh, then you 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 have to mention that you use version five of the genome. Um, indeed, 
yeah, well, you can't know everything, right? Like, I, I'm no bioinformatics, but, like, biology is not my strongest, in a way. Like, I know a lot about biology, but, it's, like, I don't know all of the names of all of the fish in the world. Because I've never studied fish that much, right? I'm originally a plant biologist. Um, but even then, like, if you point at a tree and ask me what kind of tree it is, I, I probably wouldn't know. I should know, because our professor was always very adamant about, like, us learning biology because like if you're a bioinformatician you, you should know the biology right so in my old group um we we would walk around the uh, arboretum and then um richard my old professor would point at a tree and would ask a random person like what is this type of tree so it, i still know a lot of type of trees but like it it if you don't use it right it you you forget so that that's how it works Anyway, um, question number 3b, how many data sets are available? So at the moment there are 214. Um, there used to be less. So in the answers it said um, 203 actually. So 11 new species got added in the last year or since we did it last time. All right, so we can connect to Ensemble and use a specific data set by reconnecting um, using the useMart function. We now specify two parameters, the data set, uh, the database that we want and the data set that we want to use. Um, so in this case, we wanted to connect to mouse. Um, so then, of course, we just issue the command useMart, connect to Ensemble and select the mus musculus gene Ensemble. Cichlids is a commonly kept aquarium fish. I didn't know that. I, I, I know I, I only know like this much about fish and uh, I, I know that they taste good I had salmon yesterday that was that was pretty good so. good so again right it's it's free software so you just have to wait your turn to be able to connect to the data set um, and and it's it's one of these drawbacks right because biomart is really good. Um, when you use it, um, it's just that it, it's not the quickest. But fortunately, actually, the blast results for the um, assignment 2 finished, so we can look at that while R starts connecting. Um, so here we see the uh, results. Let me zoom out a little bit more. Right, so um, what you can see here is the results, right? So you see here we, we used the myostatin gene, we blasted it to their genome ba database um, and then we can see that um, it is related to Indian bison, it's related to Bostaurus, right, there's a hundred percent identity to the own sequence. Um, we see that it's also very similar to um, Bos uh, indicus, so to zebu cattle, right, and you can see that because the E value is zero and the identity is a hundred percent. So if we want to have the first entry which is not a hundred percent, then we see that the most um, or the closest protein to myostatin, to, to uh, Bos taurus myostatin, is actually found in domesticated water buffalo. Um, so that has a 98% similarity um, and of course the E value is still zero. And if we then go down the list, one can see that the, the myostatin gene of cows is very similar to the myostatin gene in giant eland, um, which is interesting. But then one of these funny things that I always find interesting is that when you look at cow proteins, right, then and if you do a protein search for um, evolutionary distance, then when you when you look for cow proteins, they show a very high similarity to whales. And that is, of course, because of the way that whales came to be, right? A whale is a mammal, it lives in the ocean, but a whale is like, so there is a, a common ancestor between cows and whales, and the whales didn't go back to the ocean very, very long ago. It, 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 it's not a, like, million million year history it's not a billion years ago that this happened um, but it, it, I always find this really funny that when you search for cow genes um, that like whales and dolphins come up as being relatively closely related even closer related like things like sheep and goat right so the common ancestor between cows and sheep is longer ago than the common ancestor between cow and whale so whales went back to the ocean not that long ago when when 
And so cows and sheep split off much earlier in, in, in the evolutionary tree than cows and whales, um, which I always find very, very funny because you, you expect whales to be there. Good. So, connected. Yay, connected. All right, so now the next question was um, connect to the mouse database. We did that. How many attributes are provided in the mus musculus gene data set in Ensemble? Okay, so we can just um, list all of the attributes, right? So we can use our MART, say list attributes of this MART, and then I'm just going to save this in e ATTR. And now if I ask for the dimensions of ATTR, um, then you see that there are 2,983 uh, 2, different things in this database that we can query for. Um, so if we look at a couple, right, so let's look at the first like 10, um, then we can see that uh, we can retrieve gene, name, or gene IDs, uh, we can retrieve gene descriptions, um, we can receive chromosomes and start positions of genes. Um, and of course, if we if we look way, way down, and then you can see that there are also some very esotherical things that you can, for example, find the bison homolog um, confidence score of the orthologous gene, right? So there's a lot of things that you can, that you can actually query for. Um, but in total, there are 2,983 attributes that you can query for. And then when we list all of the filters, I think that's the next question, right? So we just say um, fill, which is list filters. Um, I think list filters. And then from our MART. Um, and then we ask for the dimensions of FIL. Um, then you can see that there are 396 different query options, right? So we, we have 396 different ways of telling Ensemble what we want to retrieve, right? And if we look at the first 10, right, then um, of course we can search by chromosome name, by start and end position, by strand. Um, we can search for a whole chromosomal region, um, but we can also search for um, on, uh, with all kinds of different IDs, right? So we can search, for example, if we have an, uh, an interest gene ID or if we have a European nucleotide archive ID, we can also use that to retrieve genes from Ensemble, right? So that's the nice thing because in many cases, when you have a list of gene identifiers um, and you want to query other databases, um, then you first have to translate your identifiers and Biomart is able to do that for you, right? Because you can just query using Ensemble IDs and then retrieve, for example, the Gemble IDs. So those are the, the, the IDs for the, the chemistry database, uh, the, the EMBL database for chemistry. Good. So um, how many were there in total? 396 is the answer. All other interactions with Biomart are done using the getBiomart function. The structure is as follows. Read the provided, uh, uh, what? Read the provided help and try to understand what attribute filters and values are. So I think that was made very clear in the previous lecture. Um, and then have, for a small example, imagine I want to retrieve uh, the chromosome at which myostatin is located. I know that the MGI symbol for myostatin is MSTN the same as in cows. Um, I can then retrieve this uh, using the following R command. So just show you guys that that command that I inputted actually works. Um, so, uh, I'm looking at my PDF file that I uploaded actually. So the PDF file with the answer. So I'm just saying copy this out, go here and then use this. So this was the uh, little example that was in there, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what do I want to retrieve? Well, I want to retrieve the chromosome. What am I going to provide? I'm going to provide an MGI symbol. The value is MSTN, and I want to search in the currently connected Biomart. So let's do the query, and then it will tell me that myostatin in mouse is located on chromosome one. So, good. Um, I can add as many attributes as I want to retrieve. The important part here is that I set my filter to the MDI symbol. Um, do not setting the... Ooh, that's a very poorly written sentence. When I do not set the filter parameter, what happens and why? Okay. Um, no idea why I asked that question, but... All right. So when I just do Biomart, right, and I say 
get the chromosome name and give it MSDN, then now all of a sudden you see that it comes back with almost all chromosomes in mouse because it has no idea what MSDN means, right? So I have to say to the database, the value that I'm giving you means this because otherwise it will just do a, a database wide search. And then of course you will, you will find the, the letters MSTN um, in many different positions in the genome. All right, so what is the genome location of the myostatin gene? So chromosome start and end position. So again, we use the same, um, same logic, um, but we are going to add some parameters, right? Because I don't just want to um, retrieve the chromosome name. I also want to have the start position and the end position. So it's start position, um, comma, end position. Um, again, the filter is the MGI symbol and the, um, the value is myostatin, right? So if I do this and I query Biomart, then it tells me that myostatin is of course located on chromosome one. We already knew that, um, but then the next is that, well, myostatin starts at 53 megabases, 53.1 megabases, and it ends at 53.1 megabases, right? So you can see that this gene is, um, let me actually compute that. So the gene is um, 6,439 base pairs long. Good, next question. So now we can, um, so what is the genome location? Okay, so now for something more fun, depending on your idea of fun, let's retrieve all genes near the myostatin gene. We can do this by using the chromosome or region filter. The locations are specified by chromosome, double point, start, double point, end. Right, so here again, we want to use a slightly different filter. Um, so let me switch you guys to the answers. So. Right, so here we say get Biomart. We want to retrieve the MGI symbol, right? Because I'm now not just retrieving myostatin, but I might retrieve all kinds of other genes, right? Um, so I'm going to say, give me the chromosome name, start position and end position. And then the question was, um, locate all genes that are within 200,000 base pairs of the myostatin gene. How many genes are within this region, not counting myostatin itself? Um, so here I already did the mathematics, I think. Is that proper? Yeah, it seems to be kind of okay. I might have, um, I, these, these might have been based on an, on an older version, um, right? So the start position is this. I think I took half the halfway point of the gene. So I just compute, I, I took, right? So I compute it because I'm wondering where this number comes from, right? Because the start of the gene was at 53.1 and here, no. So that's, 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 yeah. So 53.1, 200,000 base pairs earlier is 52.8 and 200,000 base pairs later is slightly above this. Um, like the answer doesn't matter too much. Um, have what matters is that you guys get to learn how to use Biomart and how you can build up these queries, right? So here we see that if we ask for the MGI symbol, the name, the start and the end position, um, we filter in this case by chromosomal region. I give it a chromosomal region that I want to retrieve. Um, then it tells me that there are one, two, three, this one doesn't count, four, five, six, seven genes within 200,000 base pairs of myostatin located on mouse chromosome one. All right, we can also combine filters using the C function. Um, imagine that I only want to have protein coding genes. I can add the filter biotype and filter for genes that have the biotype protein coding, right? So again, um, yeah, same kind of structure that we use. And so let me show you answer that I had, right? So what I do here is I say, I want to still retrieve the same things. Um, I'm going to provide two different search filters. One is chromosomal region and the other is biotype. And now um, let me actually set the syntax highlighting. Not sure why it didn't do the syntax highlighting. Um, but now here I have to use the list function. Right, because I could have retrieved not one chromosomal region, I could have retrieved like five or 10. 
I could have not asked for a single biotype, but I could have asked for like five different biotypes. Um, so because of this, I now need to provide a list. And this list is just two elements because I'm only retrieving a single chromosomal region. But now I'm saying, okay, so give me this chromosomal region and only give me protein coding genes. Right? If I would have added a second chromosomal region, then the first entry of the list would have been a vector. Right? So imagine that we can add another chromosomal region. So let's take the same region here, but now do it on chromosome two, right? Um, so now hey, I have to provide the C function because now the first entry of the list is a vector which has two entries. And then the second entry of the list is a, um, is a single entry. So let me show you guys how this looks in R. Um, because lists are different from vectors, right? So this is now how the list looked. So the first entry of the list has two regions the second entry of the list only has one entry protein coding and it will it will search for all protein coding genes in this region and protein coding genes in that region all right but that was not the question so let's go back to the question so that, let's just do the query and add the um, the additional filter for protein coding so now it tells me that of the seven genes which are located near myostatin only four of them code for a protein the other ones, like this uh, GM24349 gene, um, this is not coding for a protein. So this gene codes for something else. It might be a long non-coding RNA, it might be a microRNA, um, it, it might be a, um, uh, a tRNA that it codes for, but it doesn't code for a protein. Right, so that's that's nice. And generally, of course, we want to study protein coding genes, unless you, you're interested in microRNA. All right, so um, how many protein coding genes are there? Well, there's four, and then there's an additional question. Um, and Biomart contains information on genes, so we need to connect to another database um, to retrieve single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so um, the answer is here. So how do I do that? Well, I have to switch to a different Mart. Right, so I have to use the SNP mart in this case, um, and the data set is going to be Mus musculus SNP. Um, and let me see if that is still correct. No. So actually, the name has changed um, yeah, because here it now says that, okay, so this is an incorrect biomart name. So use the list marts functions to see which are available. So let's do list marts, and then it will tell me all of the different biomarts that I can connect to. Ooh, I should have stored this because this might be actually be a big list. Ah, it's not okay. So they renamed the Mart from having the name snipped to Ensemble Mart Snipped. So let's update that and then connect again. I hope that the name of the data set hasn't changed. Um, yeah, so just use Mart, say use the Snip Mart, so the single nucleotide polymorphism Mart, and then connect to Mus Musculus. Good, solve the assignment we started in the lecture. For all protein coding genes located on chromosome 3 between 15 megabases and 45 megabases in mouse, retrieve information about the number of protein coding genes, number of exons, and the number of SNPs per exon. That's a, that's a big, big, big question. Um, I'm just going to do the SNP one. Since I'm not, like we already did the other two, right? So we did the exons and we already did the... Um, the number of genes. Um, so if we want to retrieve the SNPs, um, then have what we do is we give it the chromosomal region that we're interested in. I don't know why I selected this region, um, yeah, but you can just query, right? So the thing that I'm actually querying for is say, give me the SNP ID, uh, give me the allele, chromosome name, chromosome start, and then it gives you big, uh, a big list of different SNPs, and it also gives you the position of this single nucleotide polymorphism. Right, and you can see that this is actually, this is a small indel, right? So the reference genome has TT, uh, the alternative allele is missing. So it's a two base pair deletion, and here we see a one base pair deletion. Good, so those were the assignments. If there's no other questions um, about the assignments, then um, we can start with the lecture, for which we still have five minutes for this hour. Good. So 
let's go back to the lecture um, genome annotation is going to be the name of the game today so that is the goal we want to annotate a new genome based on information that we might already have from other species hey, imagine that we did a new type of puffer fish or we did a new type of what was that fish called cichlid we did a new type of cichlid right this this species doesn't have a genome yet or it has a genome but it doesn't have any annotation um, then we can use the homology trick and then of course afterwards we will be talking about sequence alignment DNA motif and then whole genome sequencing and multiple sequence alignment in R right so imagine that we have a newly sequenced genome how do we annotate genes on it so imagine that I have this little sequence here on a new chromosome that I assembled using whole genome sequencing then how do I kind of annotate this well the way that you do this is just take the sequence and then we find a homologous sequence with a known function that is closest to it so it's kind of like using BLAST right so we just take the sequence then we have a database containing sequences of known function for example ensemble um, and then what we do is we just compare our sequence to all of the sequences in the database and then at a certain point we will find a match right so for example if we're annotating the whale genome then of course a lot of these matches will be proteins which are in the cow genome which are annotated as having a certain function right or a certain name so that is the homology trick and the homology trick is very very old and people always say like why does this work well this works because of Charles Darwin right we know from the origin of species um, that their life ha is a singular event which kind of happened right and then we have life branching off in all kinds of different directions and of course we have things like mutation modifying sequences and we have all kinds of other structures or all kinds of other um, processes which will make sequences different in the course of evolution but if we are looking at a new species we can always like look at a at a closely related species and then use the information from the closely related species to infer the function of sequences in our other species and so this is this is why does this work so this works because there was a single introduction event of life on planet earth and every animal living today can be traced back to this single origin so everyone's related to each other all species are related to each other and because of this we can we can use homology so how similar a sequence is in a species that we do not know or do not know much about we can use species that we know much about and then use this as the as the trick to find this out right like I told you guys so it is because of evolution so sequences are of course changed in the course of evolution and there's things like mutations that occur we have insertions that happen deletions we even have transposons so SNPs which are, are not so much, uh, we have transposons which are genes which are jumping around in the genome um, and we have things like chromosomal rearrangements like um, a whole chromosome or part of a chromosome can be duplicated um, a chromosome can break and can be inverted a part of a chromosome and we have translocation so it is even possible for a certain chromosome to break and then the piece which breaks off actually merges with another chromosome that is called a translocation right so um, the correspondence between homologous sequences is never exact it's never a hundred percent match unless you're looking at very very closely related species right if I'm looking at um, cows from Europe and comparing them with cows from India then of course the difference is going to be minor there's only going to be like a couple mutations um, yeah, but of course to do this and to 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 say that two sequences or two proteins are homologous um, we have to have a mat method to match sequences to each other and this 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 way of matching should be inexact right it should allow for duplications uh, it should allow for mutation insertions and deletions right and this is called pairwise sequence alignment why is there a minus let me actually fix that I'm uh, bothered by that pairwise sequence alignment good so that is where pairwise sequence alignment comes from right because every uh, that since since Charles Darwin we know that we can use homology but we have to have a mathematical definition of what is similar 
and how similar are these things and of course there's no single answer right like if you have two sequences um, you can look at the number of exact matches you can look at the number of gaps that you have to introduce and all of these things so there there has to be a method for inexact pattern matching um, and that is what we're going to talk about the rest of the lecture good so I'm going to stop here take a short break of 10-15 minutes um, so the first break for you guys will be that's a difficult one because I just downloaded a whole bunch of new animated GIFs because last time someone complained that they had already seen the animated GIFs before so I didn't want that to happen again um, of course if anyone has any suggestions of um, animals right because I always show animals uh, animated GIFs in the in the break if anyone has a suggestion of an animal that they really want to have then then throw it in chat of course and, and let me know um, because like for me it takes a couple of minutes to find animated GIFs of a certain species um, and then you could have your own more or less break series but I think the first break is going to be crocodiles because we didn't have crocodiles before so I will be back in 10 minutes um, I will also put on a little bit of music I think if that is possible because I am not fully set up because of the issues with the start of the stream um, but I will put on some music and I will be back in 10 minutes so we'll continue at 2.10 um, and see you 